This is a very important thing that when we come to church, we do what you just did. We praise God. Uh, but also that when we come to church, we hear the Word of God. Not just hear it, but the Bible tells us to be not just hearers of the Word, but doers. So we do what we hear. So uh, I'm very thankful that we're able to look at this today. Well, we've been going through the book of Colossians, and we've been talking about who we are in Christ. That is our identity. Now, in our world today, there are a lot of people that struggle with identity. Who am I? Um, very important question. And so uh, we need to understand that what we've seen from God's Word is that we're not who others say we are. We're not who the world says we are. We're not who our failures say we are. I promise you, you failed at something in the past, but that doesn't mean that you are a failure. Uh, we're not what our successes say we are, because God, He doesn't want you to depend on your own strength. He wants you to depend on Him. But we are who Jesus says we are. And this is an incredibly important thing to learn. Because as we go through life, the devil himself will try to convince you that you are something other than you actually are. You see, Jesus taught us this. Here's what he said about the devil. He said that he is a liar. He lies to you. Uh, you ever have that just whispering in your ear, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough. And I'm not talking about the new age, modern kind of self-help kind of silliness. You know, just because you think something or say something, that's not necessarily reality. But you ever just have the devil or whoever just whisper in your ear, you're a failure. You failed before. You've tried this before. You started this before. There's no way you could follow through with this. I know Christians that just something as simple as reading the Bible. New Year's resolution. Anybody ever do those? New Year's resolution. Uh, very common for people to say, I want to lose weight or I want to exercise. And they do exercise and they're incredibly sore and then they don't ever do it again, right? Or maybe you start and say, I'm going to read the Bible. And what happens is you read it for a couple of days and then you oversleep and you forget and you get home and uh, you're busy and you get to bed and you're like, oh man, I didn't read the Bible and you just fall asleep. I'll do it tomorrow. And then before you know it, you're not doing it. And the devil whispers, you're a failure. You don't keep your word. You might as not, well not even try. He is a liar. And he'll try to tell you that you're something that you're not. not. Here's what God's Word says you are. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, it says you're a son or a daughter of God. Now, I don't know about you, but the last time I checked, if you're part of the royal family, there's some privileges that go along with that. There's some protection that goes along with that. There's some opportunity that goes along with that. That's who you are. You are in Christ. You are able to be a conqueror. The Word of God tells us that we're more than a conqueror. You're able to be under self-control. You're able to be kind. You're able to be patient. You're able to be loving. You're able to be gentle. Anybody struggle with that one? Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. One of those nine fruits of the Spirit is gentleness. I'm not always gentle. My wife's reaction, she is a, a wonderfully kind and empathetic person. Uh, so much so that everybody in our church loves her. Me, not so much, but they love her. They love her, okay? Uh, but I don't have the same kind of personality that my wife has, when she sees someone suffering or going through difficulty, maybe even because they made bad choices, you know, she is empathetic and, and wants to love on them. When I see that, my natural reaction is, sucks to be you, all right? That's my natural reaction, okay? But here's what the Bible, the Scripture says, that the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. 
And, and the point is this, that God alone can produce fruit. I can plant seeds, I can cultivate the ground, I can water it, but I cannot grow fruit. And the same is true, you read Galatians 5, he compares the works of the flesh, in other words, things that you do in your strength, with the fruit of the Spirit. And the interesting thing is that the works of the flesh, you read that whole list that Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, it produces some bad stuff. And, and that's what God says, without the fruit of the Spirit, you'll never discover who you are in Christ. You'll never live out your potential. You'll never be what God has called you to be. Well, today we're going to ask this question from uh, the book of Colossians. What kind of church will we be? What we're going to read today, Paul was writing to this church and he was telling them how to live, what to do. Uh, they were discouraged, some of them. They were facing difficult times, some of them. And he told them how to live. He told them what kind of church to be. Now, notice the question that Paul framed was not, where will we meet? That was not the question. Now, meeting place is important. We're praying for our permanent home here uh, that God opens the door. We're walking through some doors that God seems to be opening. And you continue to pray. Pray hard this week, okay? It's important, but it's not the most important. How many of you have ever seen a church with a beautiful building and a dead congregation? I had the privilege of visiting the Cathedral of St. Giles in Scotland. Uh, man, John Knox was the pastor there. If you don't know much about church history, John Knox was one of the fathers of the Reformation, an incredibly influential person and an incredible pastor. It was a vibrant, living church. Uh, he pastored that church, and I got to stand in that building. Man, it was so cool, beautiful, uh, lots of stained glass, lots of stuff. But they just have a building. They don't have really a congregation anymore. You know what that church is used for now? It's like a museum. I went there, and it was kind of cool. There was a, a concert uh, for people with uh, special needs, and it was an amazing thing to watch how that music affected them. Uh, and there are all kinds of things for, for the community, which is good, but a church building does not make a church, okay? That, that's what we learned. I didn't ask how big will we be. Obviously, it's important that God wants people in his family. We know that from Scripture. He wants lots of people. The Bible tells us that he came uh, so that everyone could come to repentance. That's his will. Now, do, does every person get saved? No. Uh, does everyone come to Christ? No. But the truth is, that's what God wants. And for you and for me, we know that God wants people who are saved to grow in their relationship with Christ. So uh, I don't have to wonder or struggle with the idea, does God want the church to grow? He does. As long as there are people that need to be saved, as long as there are people that need to grow in their faith, God wants the church to be active. But let me tell you something. It's obvious that the pandemic affected not only us. I mean, we don't have nearly as many people coming as we used to. Uh, but it affected churches all over this nation. Studies and surveys and whatever, whoever they are, they say that less than 50% of people that went to church every week before the pandemic go to church every week now or at all. Incredible. Now, the point is that you and I need to understand that just because the church is smaller doesn't mean that it is weaker. You see, what God is interested in, he's interested in our members, our people making church a way of life, not a weekly gathering. And I'm afraid there are many Christians throughout our country that maybe church for them was just an event. Maybe church for them was a weekly gathering. It was a place where you could go and you could sing and you could feel good about things. 
and it helped you. And there's certainly nothing wrong with being helped or feeling good about going to church. I hope you don't feel bad about going to church. I hope you come and, and you get your eyes on Jesus. You get the Word of God into your life, and it changes you. But listen, it's not so important about who walks in the door as it is who walks out the door. You see, there are a lot of people that walk in, they leave and they're not changed. What God is interested in is when you walk in that you leave different than you came, that you leave closer to God, fulfilling His purpose. You see, the reason we know that a a smaller church can be a stronger church is because of the book of Acts. Now, interestingly, the book of Acts shows how the church grew and grew and grew. And, but did you know that originally, originally, when the church started, we're not talking about in a single congregation. We're talking about in the entire world, there were about 3,000 Christians. Not just in one congregation, but in the entire world. Today, there are over 2 billion Christians. Now, what is my point? My point is that God will use you if you will be what God has called you to be. So, let me just read to you from Colossians chapter 4, and we'll just read verses 2 through 6, okay? And, And I want you to take note as to what Paul writes here for us of what kind of church we should be. There are some things he calls us to be. Let's read together. He said, continue steadfastly in prayer. Continue steadfastly. Mark those two words. Uh, and he says, being watchful. Those words go along with it. So you're to be steadfast and you're to be awake. You're to be watchful. Okay, that's what he says. Uh, in it with thanksgiving, being thankful for what God is doing in your life, being thankful for what God is doing in the world. Let me ask you a question. You ever have people come up to you, or maybe you say this to somebody that has small children, boy, sure I'm glad I don't have to raise my kids in this nation today. Can I just give you permission to just uh, punch them in the nose if they say that to you? Do not be the, I know what the sentiment is that, you know, there are struggles today that I didn't face when my kids were growing up. I get that, okay? But don't be a discourager of parents. Be an encourager of parents. And understand this, the same God that was on the throne 50 years ago is on the throne today. If you have children or grandchildren, it is possible for them to serve God and to love Jesus. In fact, I would say it's not only possible, but in the environment that we live in, it might be that it's a better opportunity for them to have absolutely everything in their life changed. Why? Because especially among young people, you know what they're looking for? They're looking for something real. They're looking for authentic. And they're not going to commit to a dead church. We have an opportunity to be light in the darkness. So he says, do it with thanksgiving. Be thankful for what God's doing in your life. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. See, Paul, this is what is called a prison epistle. Now, an epistle is a letter. That's an ancient word for letter. So Paul wrote this letter. Now, was it just like, you know, an email? Was it a text? No, he actually wrote it, okay, uh, old school, really old school. But this was a letter that was written, and it was inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, guided and directed Scripture, okay? Now, I'm not sure if Paul knew if he was writing Scripture at the time, but he was following the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That word means to be God-breathed. So God was breathing this through Paul. God was controlling what Paul wrote so that not only could those churches understand and be encouraged and be blessed, but so that nearly 2,000 years later, you and I could be encouraged and blessed. So he said, I'm in prison because of this. By the way, can I just, this is a little rabbit trail. Uh, Can I just tell you that sometimes the reason things don't work out for you, the reason you don't get to do what you dreamed of doing is because God had something bigger for you, something more important for you. Do you know 
that Paul did not want to go to prison? Well, that, that's probably a no-brainer, right? Nobody wants to go to prison. But you know what Paul was planning on doing? He was planning on going and doing a big crusade, an event. He wanted to go to Rome. And what happened? Instead of getting able to do his crusade, you know what God did? He put him in prison. Prison. But did you know that most of, or the, the largest portion of what Paul wrote in Holy Scripture that you and I have today, he did it while he was in prison. You see, Paul wanted to influence a city, but God wanted him to influence the world for Jesus Christ. He didn't want him just to influence his generation. He wanted him to influence 2,000 years or the people that would come to know Jesus Christ. Sometimes the things that you think are the bother, that are the failure, that are the shortcoming, God has something bigger in mind for your life. Now, we won't ever know this till we get to heaven, but I wonder if there are things in your life, maybe that God knocked you off course a little bit. Maybe your dreams didn't quite work out like you thought, but God uses that to do something greater. You see, in the book of Ephesians, it says that he will do infinitely more than we could ever ask or think through the power of the Holy Spirit at work within us. God wants to use you. And maybe you feel like a failure because you don't know who you are. Paul did. He's like, I'm in prison. He even mentions it in his letter. But he says, I'm in prison on account of Christ. But he said, pray that I make it clear, talking about the word, the gospel, which is how I ought to speak. He's saying, pray that people understand. And then he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, we see three things in this passage. You can write them down if you like. Three different characteristics that God wants from you and me that he wants from the church. And here's the first one. Number one, God wants a persistent church. Persistent. He said, continue steadfastly. Let me ask a question, and this is a rhetorical question because I know the answer to it. You ever get discouraged? You ever just think, well, man, I might as well give up. I know a lot of people that actually were going to church, not just this church, but churches all around this area, all around this country, and uh, people that were, were going, and through the pandemic and through different circumstances, they get discouraged and they quit. They just quit. Why? They didn't continue steadfastly. They got knocked off course. But Paul writes this. He said uh, that we're to be steadfast. Don't give up. Now, here's, now if you think that um, pastors don't get discouraged from this kind of thing that happened, then you're wrong, okay? They do. In fact, uh, most, there's kind of a running joke among pastors. They say, I don't ever want to quit except for every Monday morning. And you know that there is a crisis in our country right now for pastors. Did you know that there are 40% fewer pastors today than there were in 2020 because of the pandemic? And we need pastors more now than we ever have, okay, to preach and teach the Word of God. Here's what Paul wrote. He said, don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Now, I've been discouraged from things for sure, but you know why I can stay encouraged? Because of the words of Jesus. I have friends, and I rebuke them in love when they say this, pastor friends. Well, the church is never going to be the same. And I'm like, well, thank God. Maybe it needed to change. And people are like, well, it's never going to come back. Do you know why I believe that's a lie from the devil? Because of what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church. Don't you get discouraged. You say, well, you know, not many people are going anymore. Well, that's true, not as many. But let me tell you something. God says that he's not giving up on the church, and you don't need to give up on it either. That's the plan of Jesus. Um, you see, God wants the church to be all in. 
And, and he wants this church to be strong. And he wants us to follow Jesus. Jesus promised that he would build the church. And Jesus promised that um, things are going to go according to his plan. So why do I not concern myself with, are there people going to be saved? Yes. Are there people going to come to Christ? Yes. Are there people going to come to church? Yes. Are there people that are going to grow in their faith and make commitments of their life and their family? Yes. Yes. But once again, maybe what we need is a revival of not so much of holier-than-thou kinds of church members, but of people that understand the kindness and the love and the grace of God that welcome with open arms uh, people that need Jesus in the church. That's what we need. But another reason why I know that God's not finished with the church yet is because of the prophecy that's found in the book of Joel. Now, Joel is an Old Testament book. Joel was a minor prophet. Now, I'm not sure exactly why they called them minor prophets because maybe they weren't quite as well known. They didn't have as great of a ministry. Isaiah was an incredible prophet, and he wrote one of the, my favorite books of the Bible. Um, but Joel, his was, he was considered a minor prophet. And I don't have time to read the whole book of Joel, but in the book of Joel, it prophesies about what's going to happen in the last days. Now, if you're wondering, we live in the last days. Now, I realize that there are people that um, they make prophecies on television or on their radio show or on the internet, and they're like, Jesus is going to come back on this date. You better give this. You better buy this. You better do that. And I know that the Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour. And so when a person says Jesus is coming back at this exact date, I know that's not the date. Okay? Um, but uh, so be careful when you uh, say, well, you know, there's no way Jesus uh, can't tarry his coming for more than a year. I'm mean, within a year, he's going to be here. Well, we don't know that, okay? But you know what we do know? We know that we're living in the last days. You know why? Because in the New Testament, it says that we are. And Jesus said that we are. And he's referring to the days during when the church and the Holy Spirit. You see, when the church started, the Holy Spirit came and he indwelled every believer. So if you're a follower of Christ, if you've been saved and become a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells you, Okay. So these are the last days. That's what the Scripture refers to. Now, does that mean Jesus could come today? Yes, he might. Does that mean he might tarry his coming for another 100 years or 500 years? Yes, we don't know the answer to that, okay? But what we do know is that he is coming, and we know that we live in the last days. Now, here's what God said about the last days. And see if you pick up on anything that's happening in the world around us from this prophecy from Joel. I don't have time to read the entire book, obviously, of Joel, but I'm going to read just a few selected verses from Joel chapter 2. The Lord says, I will give back what you lost. Do you ever notice that when you get saved, that God restores things? Some of you, uh, you, you lost your time. You wasted your youth. You wasted your time. You know what God promises? He'll put you in a position where you'll be more effective. Your, your time will be more effective. Some of you lost your influence. And God says, I will restore through the power of God. Uh, some of you lost your health. Now, I'm not suggesting that every person that is unhealthy as a Christian is going to be healed in this life. I do believe every Christian gets healed, 100%. God will either heal you naturally, your body, He'll heal you medically through doctors and medicine. He will heal you miraculously. We've seen God do miraculous healings of people in our church, okay? People that had cancer, and we prayed for them, and God healed them. That's a miracle, okay? But then there are people that we pray for that die. They get sick. And here's what I say. God heals those people permanently because he takes them home to heaven. No matter what kind of healing you get here on this earth, unless you get the permanent kind, 
you're still going to die one day. God can do a supernatural miracle. Of the people that Jesus healed in the New Testament, we read stories, blind Bartimaeus, people that couldn't walk, people that he raised back to life from the dead, Lazarus. You know what's true about every single one of those people? And I'm sure that they were very thankful for what God did in healing. Jesus healed them. You know what is true about every one of them? They're dead. They died. Okay? Now, what am I saying? Any healing physically here is temporary in nature because you're going to die. But thank God there is a healing that is permanent in nature. When you go to heaven, you'll be with Jesus. No more tears, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more pain. Can I get an amen from the old people? All right. The older I get, the more pains I have that pop up that I wasn't expecting. Um, you know, and things just are more difficult as you get older. Even drying off. Have you ever noticed this? Uh, that you think you dry off, you get out of the shower, you think you're, think you're completely dry, and you bend over to get deodorant out of the cabinet, and a pint of water pours out of your belly button. <laughs> Look, the fact is, God wants to heal. He said, He'll restore what you lost. He said, then after doing those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, your sons and daughters will prophesy. You see, before it used to be the professionals. They were the only one that could do it. But God says, uh, men and women and lay people and those that are not professional clergy, he's called us to prophesy. Now, don't be afraid of that word. I'm going to tell you what that means in just a second. He says, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And I believe the reason he wasn't trying to diss on the old guys. He was saying that there are people that think that they're done. There are people that think that they're finished. There are people that think that God cannot use them anymore, but God will use you if you'll turn to him. He's going to use you. That's what he does in the last days. He says, in those days, I will pour out my spirit even on the servants. In other words, you don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be clergy. God's going to use everyone, men and women alike. But every, and I love this because this is where we get this quote in the New Testament. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, this was a prophecy about what God was going to do, and he's doing it today. That's why I don't give up on the church. That's why I don't believe God is finished yet. That's why I believe that our best days are ahead of us. That's why I believe that Jesus is still going to work in our community, in our church, in our homes, in our world. Why? Because he said he would. And by the way, if we can't trust him on that, how can we trust him for saving us? I just believe everything he said was true. Well, here's what I know about this. God restores. God restores. You know what I pray every week of my life? I pray that God makes the enemy give back what he stole from us. Maybe he stole something from you. Maybe, maybe you did something dumb. And maybe you lost your business or maybe you lost your marriage or maybe you lost uh, your influence or your position. Can we pray that God, who is a God of forgiveness, God, who is a God of love, that he will restore what the enemy gave back to us. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get that marriage back, but maybe you'll get a blessed marriage the next time. Maybe God will use you more. Maybe you won't get your job back, but God will restore something in your life. Same is true for the church. Make the enemy give back what he stole from us. Why? Because Jesus has already won it. And then he tells us to be awake and alert. Uh, that's what that phrase, those two words, being watchful means, to be awake. And here's what I know. Being awake when you're doing something important, and I'll give that caveat, is more important than being asleep. Now, being asleep at night is important. But I can remember the many, many times in my life that I stayed up all night. That was in my youth. I can't really do that anymore. But when I was in high school, uh, we would go fishing, and we would go what was called gigging. And we'd take a gig that uh, we'd gig for fish, and we'd gig for frogs and stuff. 
and it was wonderful fun. We'd wade through these creeks and streams, and we'd, we'd catch fish all night. And I remember several occasions that I did that all night, didn't get in bed, and had to go to school the next day. My dad was not one of those that said, oh, you're, come here, honey, you go and sleep uh, because you're a little, little child. No, he didn't do that. He's like, I'm like, Dad, I'm sleepy. He said, well, you shouldn't stay up all night. I said, well, I was with you. What do you, what do you mean? He's like, <laughs> he made me go to school. Now, just because I went to school doesn't mean that I was awake in school. Now, I got some bad habits when I was in college. In my undergrad, um, I had to take biblical languages. I took Greek and I took Hebrew. And um, I can remember on many occasions, I, I took uh, a couple years of Greek and uh, we translated, we learned to translate and I translated about half of the New Testament. I mean, it was just, uh, whew, it was a nightmare. Anyway, uh, it was a very, very difficult class. But I can remember on many occasions. Why? Because I was a sophomore in college, 18, 19 years old, when I was taking this Greek to begin with, and I felt like that it was much, much, much more important that I stay up all night and play cards with my friends than it was that I study for Greek the next day. Now, if I don't understand all the Greek today, you can blame it on when I was a sophomore in college, all right? Uh, thankfully, I do have uh, software, Bible software, that translates all that so I can give you the Word of God without having to have been awake in Greek class when I was 19 years old, okay? Now, I, here's what I did, because the Christian college I went to, you had to wear like a, a tie, and so I carried my briefcase around. Now, you may have thought, well, yeah, you're like a little businessman, weren't you? Nope. It was a prop, because what I would do with my briefcase, I'd go into class, I'd open it up, and I'd put my hands in my head like this behind the briefcase, and I would sleep through most of my class. Now, let me tell you what Paul wrote, and you do not need to miss this. He said, be awake. God is looking for an awake church, not one that sleepwalks through your Christian life. God is looking for a church that is awake. Well, I've got two more points, and I've got like four minutes to give them to you, so let me just do it quickly, okay? Uh, the second thing, God wants a praying church, a praying church. He wants a persistent church, but he wants a church that prays. Here are the things he tells us in this passage to pray for. He says, pray persistently. It's important that you pray. Pray regularly. Pray for alertness. Pray that God makes you aware by the way, Jesus let us know uh, through the writing of James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, you know what he said? He said, if anyone will call on God and ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. You need to be alert. Ask God to be alert. Ask God for wisdom. Pray for thankfulness. Practice it. Be thankful. That's what he says. And then he says, pray for your pastor. And I, I love this. Paul said, uh, pray for me. Pray for the church leadership. Pray for your pastor. Pray that, and Paul prayed something very, very interesting. He prayed for open doors. Those are divine appointments that God opens in our life to be able to be an influence for him. Pray for open doors. Maybe you need an open door in your job. Maybe you need an open door if you're single. Uh, you want to meet a good Christian that can be a part of your family, that you can marry and, and so forth. Yes, pray for open doors. But mainly, he tells us to pray for these open doors of the gospel. That's why we're sending a, a missions team to the Dominican Republic in just a couple of weeks. We're doing this. I, I was sharing with uh, uh, some people this week uh, while I'm gone, I'm going to be gone on this trip, okay? While I'm gone, I'm going to preach about five times in different, I'm going to teach pastors one night. A bunch of pastors are going to be able to teach them some things. Uh, I'm going to uh, preach to a Christian group one day. I'm going to do, I'm the speaker for an evangelistic crusade that's this, for this whole region. I have no idea how many people are going to be there, 
but I get to preach on that. And then I get to preach in one of the churches on Sunday morning that I'm going to be there. Okay, it's going to be good. But here, here's the point. Don't miss it. Pray for an open door. An open door. God has an open door. Maybe you don't ever go on a missions trip and preach like that. But there's an open door in your job. There's an open door in your neighborhood. Pray for open doors. Pray for opportunities for the gospel. And then I love this. Paul did something very practical. He said, pray that the word of God is understood and received. What is the point of preaching if people don't understand it? What is the point of giving people the word of God if they think it's irrelevant to their life? What is the point of teaching what God says if nobody understands what it means? You see what I'm saying? So God says, do that. Pray for that. And then here's the last thing. God wants a prophesying church. Now, I know that some of you are like, well, you just got carried away with the alliteration and you couldn't find a real word there, so you use the word prophesying. Let me tell you, this is exactly what this text tells us to do. Now, you may be a little afraid of that word. Some people are. But the word prophesy, here's what it means. It means to speak or sing, important, by inspiration, in other words, you're inspired by the Spirit of God, as a witness to Jesus Christ. That's what it means. And so a while ago, the reason I know this was happening is because of your response. You know what our team here on the stage was doing? They were prophesying about Jesus Christ and letting you know how wonderful he is and how great it is. And you were receiving it, and they were just simply telling us about Jesus telling us how great he is, telling us that we ought to worship him. It means to proclaim by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me take this where it's practical for you and me. Uh, Because some of you read that, you know, yeah, the pastor, that's what you got to do. No, no, that's what you do. That's what you do. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he says, you shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And he said, this is where you're going to go all around. Now, I used to think that meant that you had to have a church visitation program where you went and knocked on people's doors and handed them a gospel tract and asked the question. We did some dumb things back in the day. We asked, they taught us to do this. We would introduce ourselves. Hi, I'm Richie Miller. Uh, I want to ask you a question. If you were to die today, where would you go? Now they're like, serial killer, get off my porch. It is a miracle that we didn't get shot, okay? I mean, can you imagine doing that? To, now I realize we live in a different culture today, but what a shocking question to ask someone. But you know what you don't have to be shocking about is that you are a witness. You know what a witness is? Somebody just tells what's going on. Somebody tells what they saw. Hey, I just want you to know, man, my family was a mess. And I, we started going to this church, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And thank God, it saved our marriage. Thank God, our kids love going to this church. And when somebody in your work hears that, they're like, well, give me some of that. I need that bad. And you know what you're not doing? You're not standing up on a stump and, uh, you know, yelling at people and veins sticking out on your neck, making them feel uncomfortable. You know what you're doing? You're witnessing. You're being a witness to what Jesus did. Man, I wish you could have heard that song that we did yesterday at church. My goodness, it was so good. I left there. I was so uplifted. And they're like, well, you know, all I had was my in-laws come over yesterday. And I wasn't uplifted at all. In fact, my mother-in-law is kind of mean. She doesn't like me. And I need some uplifting. Maybe they'll come to church. You see what I'm saying? God wants you and me to be a witness. That's what that word prophesy means. So he says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious. Season with salt so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Now, the interesting thing is that in context, he's talking about our walk. Do you know in the Bible when it talks about your walk, it's talking about your life, the way you live. And what Jesus wants us to understand is that 
our walk is to be a walk of prophesying. I don't mean you have to get a TV program. I don't mean you have to write a book. I don't mean you have to scare everybody. I mean that to prophesy, you're proclaiming Jesus. That's all you're doing. Uh, to prophesy, you're being a witness. Man, I'll tell you what I've seen. I, I, I don't have all the answers. By the way, you don't have to have a seminary degree to be a witness. You don't have to be a pastor to be a witness. You know what? You're an expert on what's going on in your life. You're an expert on what God's done for you. Well, I don't know about all that, but here's what I know. My life was this way, and when I met Jesus, it's completely different now. You see, a witness to prophesy. And he tells us we have to have wisdom to do this. Wisdom in our actions. Don't be a person that ruins your witness because of your actions. Wisdom in our time. Sometimes we think the most innocuous things are not harmful to our life, but maybe they are. Do you waste your time? Do you ever spend time with the most important things? Oh, we're all busy. I get all that. But that's not what he's talking about. He said, make the best use of your time. Do the most important things. Then he said, have wisdom in your speech. Are you one of those that you harass people at work? Are you kind? Do people dread when you come in the room? Do they react negatively when they see you in the neighborhood? You see, he says we're to use wisdom in our speech, and then he says we're to use wisdom in our witness. Be wise and make the most of your time. You see, the great question that God proposes to every believer is not a matter of place. That's where we meet. It's not a matter of programs. That's how we're entertained when we're at church. Um, it, it's not the number of people. You know what it's about? It's about power and purpose. You see, he says, I want you to be this kind of church. The power of the Holy Spirit it's not so important how you walk in, it's important how you walk out. I want you to live according to my purpose. And he says, when we do that, we'll live in power. We'll be awake and we'll be all in. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to be all in. Lord, we're not holding back it's not just about a weekly meeting, but it's about a transformation. It's about a lifestyle. It's about a way we live. And God, help us to be that. Because Jesus, we know that you're going to build the church. Jesus, we know that you promised to be with these kinds of people. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be that. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. If you are watching online and maybe you don't even really know what I'm talking about. Maybe you need to receive Christ. Maybe you don't even know what that means. And it means this. It means that you admit that you can't be reconciled to God by yourself. In other words, not by your goodness. It's not by joining a church. It's not being a good person, helping the little old ladies across the street. That's not what it's about. It's about trusting in what Jesus did. Jesus died on the cross for your sin so that you could be reconciled to the Heavenly Father. And so, if you need that, you know it. You can feel the Holy Spirit drawing you. You may not even know what it was. Maybe you just like, you felt kind of weird, but you're attracted to it, you couldn't understand it. Well, that's God at work in your life. And maybe what you need to do is something like this. Just pray a simple prayer, committing your life to Jesus Christ. Dear God, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe He died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I believe He died for my sins. I'm asking you to forgive me, to save me, to change me. I want to live for you in Jesus' name. If you'll pray that prayer, uh, click. There's a button at the bottom that lets us know that you prayed to receive Christ. And then fill out that next step card so we can help you take your next step.